Hello and welcome to episode 40 of the Clax Women for Indie podcast. Something a little bit different for you this week. Instead of our usual uh, mutterings in the, the, the cafe, we had a guest at the latest Clax Wifey Zoom this week, Peter Rolfe, a retired professor of media psychology. And what a fascinating guy to listen to. He shared with us some ways that grassroots organisations, grassroots people can organise to try and fight back and seize control of the narrative against the combined might of the Westminster propaganda machine, which is undoubtedly being unleashed on us right now. We spent an hour and a half or so with Peter and ideas were just tumbling out. And at the end of it, we had to stop and let our brains cool down a bit. Uh, Our next step will be to work out what we do with all these ideas. But what we wanted to do for this podcast, we're just sharing a big chunk of the discussion so you can hear Peter's ideas and also perhaps start to think in your own groups, whether you're yes groups or wifey groups or just collection of individuals, start to think of things that you can do. Because some of these are really simple and they can be really effective if we're clever. And I think with Indie Live Radio as well, we've got a real opportunity to use that as a, a hub to distribute some of some of these ideas and some of these communications. So really excited to see where this goes and would love to hear from anybody who is similarly inspired by what Peter's got to say and fancies maybe getting together to discuss how we could make something of this. So without further ado, here's Peter when he joined the Clax Wifey Zoom. Well, just to give you... Back of post stamp biography, I'm a retired lecturer in media psychology, and um, I'm a long time uh, supporter of Scottish independence. I'm not a member of any political party because I'm just one of those people that don't join things, but I have a very keen interest in securing independence for Scotland, and I'm hoping that uh, any of the skill sets I have might be useful to the group. So I invited Peter along because he, he wanted to reflect on the sort of propaganda war that's going on between the independence movement and the Tories, which I'm very, very worried about myself personally as well. And so I just wanted to give Peter an opportunity to, to, to have a wee chat about that. Yeah. Um, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Peter, over to you, sir. Right. Well, I should <laughs> try to be as brief as I can. Um, as I currently see it, The the real battle that's taking place right now is between what I would describe as the the ideological state apparatus, that's all the media outlets of state, and essentially what is social media. So we have this unequal contest. Now, as I see, the key determiner of what changes people's minds is actually to win the propaganda war. If we don't win the propaganda war, then we simply lose the war. It's it's that simple. And every day you have the this mainstream media pumping out anti independence copy. Now that's something that we have to meet head on. In terms of actually changing people's minds We're never going to change somebody's mind who is a committed unionist. And that's because the way the human mind works, people get embedded in their own ideas, in in their own matrix. It's very difficult. What we can do is shift the balance. And that means we have to gain the initiative in order to, to win the propaganda war. So the next question is, how do we actually achieve that? What are the key determiners that make it possible to win a propaganda war? The thing is, you've, you've got to be media savvy, which means you have to have all the various different aspects and components of the media lined up at your disposal. 
The second thing is you've got to have a key message. Now, the key message isn't something you can just churn out to everyone. The key message has to be what we used to call in, in, in the media psychology group at university was the, the question of segmentation, how you segment social groups. Now, every social group is going to have a different requirement for a mind shift. So in order to make the propaganda more effective, we have to understand who we're actually talking to. Obviously, if we're talking to a young person 16, we're not talking to the same person at 65 years of age. So we have to tailor our copy towards particular segmented groups. The third aspect is what sort of medium are we actually going to use? Are we going to use media such as um, Facebook or Twitter or Zoom or simply making our own independent films and aid from YouTube? Then the question arises, if we're going to do this kind of media exposure, how are we going to do it? What are the modalities and the mechanics involved in actually doing this? One suggestion was that we make short two-minute videos, much in the same way as the SNP are doing just now. And that would mean local groups just going out, for example, to some place that gives you a good media backdrop, because that's just as important as the message. So, for example, if you would live in Stirling, you would have the backdrop of the, the Wallace Monument. If you live in St. Andrews, you might have the big ruined cathedral behind you. See what I'm saying? So, once you've got your medium organized, your backdrop organized, you then have to think about your message. I believe it's entirely possible that each one of us, using a cell phone, could actually go out right now somewhere that gives a good backdrop and simply do a two-minute video where we actually talk to a neighbor. So you take somebody with you and you would have a conversation about just like somebody overhearing a neighbor talking. Now the reason for that is if you're just simply somebody talking from the screen as I am just now, people just switch off. So what you've got to do is you've got to create the illusion of a dialogue. It's a bit like commercials where the nosy neighbor comes into the kitchen and they have this in, inane conversation about which washing powder is best. Oh my God, you're using Persil. Oh, you should be using this. So that kind of dialogue <laughs> gives a certain veracity to what you're saying. It makes it rather more highlighted. In that way, you can get your message across. And if you're tailoring your message properly, then you're going to reach your social target group. Final thing is, we have to be aware that this kind of propaganda war is fought in many fronts. So once it gets started, you're going to get a lot of flack and interference from the established media. But that's a good sign because it shows it's working. At the moment, the propaganda war is totally asymmetrical. The mainstream media have the agenda, and right now, the London regime is currently working on a propaganda onslaught in Scotland. So we have to be aware of this. We have to match it. We can't match it symmetrically, but we can match it asymmetrically. That's the key to winning the propaganda war. That's really as much as I want to say. Just a few things from what you're saying that, that popped into my mind as you were saying them. One is... We have a platform or several platforms for hosting small films. So that kind of thing you know, seems very possible to me. There was one little niggle when you were talking. I think it's the word propaganda, because that to me suggests it's a message that may not be true. Whereas I think for us to have the moral high ground, do we not need to make sure that we're squeaky clean in what we're saying because you know winning a leave campaign by lying i don't want to win an indie campaign by lying to, to answer your question directly it's actually a, a misconception that propaganda is is fundamentally about lying what we're actually doing is we're engaging the public relations campaign now that's an entirely different ball game first rule of public relations is to simply get your message across Make your mission statement available to everyone. That's all we're doing. 
we're not going to go in and start lying in a, in a way that that's going to cause us more problems than anything else. Mm. We're not Leni Riefenstahl. We're not going to go out there and produce triumph for the will. What we're doing is we are undertaking a public relations campaign very effectively, segmenting it, targeting it, and in that way we get our message across. Yeah, I think public relations is a much easier word than propaganda, isn't it? The two kind of sort of drift into each other. You are right in, in, in the sense that the London regime is already using propaganda negatively. Mm. So I think that a lot of people who are even sitting in defence in terms of independence are already aware of that. What we have to do is to expose that. And you're absolutely correct. What we don't want to do is go in, you know, telling big porky pies and dibs about it. What we need to do is have a clear, direct message that people will understand. So I presume a lot of this is taking lessons learned from the 2014 campaign um, and taking into account that obviously now Project Fear has to take on slightly different guises because, of course, people are naturally suspect about the promises that were made and then not fulfilled afterwards, but then obviously trying to capitalise on that. So I know for myself that a lot of criticism of the 2014 situation was that there wasn't enough information for people in terms of the fears that they naturally had, their daily income to be one of them, for them to be reassured to vote yes. You started piece by saying about what would matter to a certain group but not necessarily matter to another group. So are you talking about within those videos that you suggested, which are a lot more like um, Phantom Power type videos, is that more about having particular um, groups set up to do particular subjects so that the information is there for people or are you expecting people to have a more kind of generalized approach to that well i think you're absolutely right and you've correctly identified the matrix of this particular problem in which we are engaged in the first rule is to very clearly segment the social group you're talking to so obviously if i go down to to a deprived social housing estate I'm going to talk about the issues that these folks are concerned with. They're less concerned with the more strategic issues, but they are concerned with, where's the next meal coming from? How am I going to feed my kids? What's the London regime going to do that's going to affect my life? Am I going to have a job? These are things. For example, when you look at, at areas that have a very strong preponderance of labour voters, uh, places like, for example, over the West Coast, Helensburg, you have people like Jackie Bailey. Now, when Jackie Bailey was under attack about losing this terrible nuclear deterrent, the very first thing she did was talk about jobs. Why? Because a huge swathe of people in her constituency are involved in working at Fast Lane. So we have to do exactly the same thing. So we're talking in Bridge of Allen, which is a fairly well-to-do, leafy suburb with people who have their own concerns. They're going to be concerned maybe with things like environmental issues, or they're going to be concerned with, is my banking account going to be secure? Am I going to make, it, make the same amount of interest in my bank account? Uh, what's going to happen with my mortgage and stuff like that? Mm. So the more you tailor and segment your message, the more successful you're going to be. When I look at some of the Lib Dem campaigns, for example, I see what is essentially a strategic failure to actually grasp the whole concept of public relations and segmentation. And if, if you want a, a paradigm for this, just look at TV advertising, where, where audiences are segmented. For example, when you look at these lottery commercials, what you see are people who front the commercials who look alike, people like Prince Harry or... Joe Carol Riley. Portman. Yeah, that's right. That's it. So... What you have is a PR sketch that is deliberately and strategically targeted to a particular audience. So what they do is they go down to some council house area, they have people, they get out the houses, they're standing in the street, and the minute the question of the lottery is mentioned, they go into all these kind of poses, the women do this, Ooh, I'm so excited. <laughs> now that's all carefully thought out beforehand. That's, that's strategic public relations. You wouldn't do that downtown from Bridge of Allen. You certainly wouldn't do it in Aviemore. So it's, it's getting not just what we 
say it correct in the message. It's also getting the social semantics correct mm. as well. Because if you get the social semantics wrong, they're not going to listen to the message. That's really interesting what you think. Because our experience of being on the street stall in Alloa was exactly that. People were coming up talking about their own personal situations and experiences with the health service or access to care for relatives yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah. So we give you a personal story of their experience for the NHS. They would have talked about how poor the NHS in Scotland is. Exactly. They started off with, the N- everybody knows the NHS is terrible and the health service is awful. And you said, is that your experience? They went, oh, no, me. It's been brilliant with me and my husband. They've been great. And you think, well, why are you overriding your own personal experience because you think everybody else has a different experience, which has got to come from messaging. Yeah, potential um, celebrity influence in this kind of situation, because uh, the reason it's coming to mind is a couple of days ago, I saw again a post that reminded me about the, the kind of love letter that several celebrities gave to Scotland to say, you know, please stay in the union mm. previously. Do you feel there's a place for something to counter that? Or do you feel that actually that, didn't have very much effect at all at the time? Well, that's a very good question. I, I think the answer lies in who you're actually talking to. If you look at the, the key uh, upper social groups, that's the A1, B1, B2s, they are much less likely to be influenced by celebrities. Because the lower social groups, the C1s and C2s, and below that, watch a lot of television they're much more likely to be uh, to be influenced by, by key celebrities like Sean Connery or people like that. It all depends who you're talking to, and that really is the public relations rule for everything. It all depends who you're talking to. There's actually a key media word for this. It's called interpolation, and that is voice and presentation and the language you're talking to a particular social group. And advertisers and ad men know this very well. It's the first thing they're taught. They're taught about segmentation, they talk about semantics, they talk about semiotics. These are all key things we need to understand. For example, if I was doing a, a short video, say, in uh, downtown Sterling in Raplock, I wouldn't get a man to do it. I'd get a woman to do it. Why? Because there's something in the presentation of women that is somehow more acceptable. People are less likely to argue with a woman. So if you get some nice old lady who goes downtown and just says, I want to give you a wee chat this morning with my neighbor here. Here she is. This is Mrs. McGinty. And you're having this private chat. chat. Now, right away, there is a certain veracity in that, a certain truthfulness that comes out. On the other hand, if you get somebody in an authority suit and a shirt and tie, who looks very well to do, they're much less likely to believe that. What you have to do is what we used to call in literature suspension of disbelief. You move from rejection and disbelief of what you're seeing to acceptance. That is the challenge of public relations. That is the challenge of every television commercial, suspension of disbelief. Well, I don't know where you're going to find any nice old women because we're all nice, but none of us are old. <laughs> well, get, a, get an old wig and make yourself look about nice. <laughs> oh, no, no, now you're saying we need like a hair and makeup department. That's <laughs> <what I'm saying>. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when we were, tr- we were out there on the streets trying to get voters sign up and that Connie went into yeah. the Raploch and did exactly what you're saying. And if, I mean, Connie's not, not on the call today, but I think, Peter, you would find she matches your description to a T. That's good. That's mm. great. Yeah. And so what, what we learned from this is that not only is the, the message important, but the medium, how you convey it, is also strategically important as well. So just touching on three things for the media. Firstly, the backdrop. Secondly, who you have presenting it, and thirdly, the speaking voice you use to address people. So, for example, if I went down to, say, some you know, frightful sink estate in Edinburgh, and I began talking about semiotics and semantics and stuff like that, they're going to say, is, you know, who the hell is this? On the other hand, if I go down there and I speak the way they do, then they're going to start to listen. And that's what you often find 
political broadcasts lack because they're they're working on the assumption they're talking to this great homogenous audience who all believe similar things to what they do. It's a nonsense. It's never going to work. Yeah, it's, it's going to say a bit like when police officers, when you went to deal with whatever job you were sent to, sometimes you were sent to deal with a maybe there'd be a break in and a bit a massive house in the grave which is different to going down and dealing with a, a, a neighbour in, in Gilmerton who's let their dog crap on their other neighbour's door. So you would have to change your approach so that you could relate to the, the, the people you, you were dealing with. That's right. And another thing as well, have you noticed these TV commercials where the guy comes onto the screen with a dog? What's a dog doing in a TV commercial? Are they advertising dog food? No, it's to add veracity. That's what it's all about. Hey, I must be a nice guy because I've got a dog. You see what I'm going with that? So it's, it's getting not just the message right, but the semantics and presentation right as well. And that has to be very carefully thought out. So you need people to sit down and write a photo script of what you're going to do, how you're going to say it, where it's going to be. I'm just thinking in terms of a practical perspective, with us as, as women for India, but obviously we're clap manager based, this group. And there's a lot of variety within Clap Manninshire, which we've barely scratched the surface of in terms of what we've been able to do. We were just getting going with street stalls when the pandemic shut everything down. So once we're able to get out and about again, I could certainly see some merit in us going around different areas and trying different approaches and picking different people to take the lead on things. I'm just wondering whether the face-to-face -face discussion might be our most powerful weapon or whether we could actually reach more people by doing the, the filmed conversations things. Because presumably a conversation between two of us could be as valid as us and a neighbour. Absolutely. Couldn't we? Yeah, that's right. And I mean, we could as do that on different remember. locations. Correct. As long as you remember who you're talking to. The minute you forget who you're talking to, you've lost it. Yeah. You know, they're just going to switch off. Because we've got such so. a variety of accents in our group, but there's people who aren't on the call who, who could add to the richness of that again. Connie, Lorraine, you know, and then we've got Tracy, a Scots speaker. Yeah. So there's an awful lot we could bring to that. That's yeah. right. Well, you have to choose your, your presenter very carefully. I mean, for example, I don't see any problem with somebody having a down south accent fronting a commercial because the effect of that will be to kind of... Um, psychologically astonish the person you're listening to and they'll say, hey, what's a person from Doncaster talking about independence? Mm. Wake up, guys. There are a lot of people from down south who really want Scottish independence. Why? Because they love Scotland. Mm. So right away, you've identified the, the key of what we call semiotics, which is the presenting image of what you're trying to do. Nice old ladies are great. Guys with dogs are great. But certainly... The right accent in the right area can really make what we call a switch, and that's what you're trying to do. I think the, the then the next question that sort of springs is, what is our channel for getting those out there? Because um, we've got our own Facebook and Twitter, but I would be pretty sure that the people who follow us are already um, of a mind with us. So it's how do you get it, you know, out into the wider yeah. world? If I can come back to one of the things Peter said about the backdrop, during the pandemic, um, there's been quite a lot of people going out doing their daily exercise in beautiful parts of Scotland and just doing like little blogs on their travels. They've become, I, I, don't, I, I don't have a name for you, but there's one lady up in um, Aberdeenshire who's been doing it a lot. She seemed to have a tremendous following. And it's not a political thing, it's more about um, how beautiful the backdrop was, etc., etc. But it seems to me that we've kind of almost lost an opportunity already. But we could do it just within Clack Manninshire over the next couple of weeks because we've we've got enough mobility now that we can get out in our own doorsteps. And even if we paired up and had some conversations that might be on Clack Manninshire, you know, iconic views or something, and at the same time, you can be subtly dropping in a little bit. I mean, if, imagine the conversation we would have at Cambus Kenneth Abbey, for example, or underneath the Wallace Monument, or even the bridge at Dollar, looking along the, the burn and up to the castle, you know, they almost every view in Clackmanshire leads you into a conversation about Scottish history and, and future. 
and also there's a captive audience thing. I mean, a lot of people have been um, locked in their houses for so long, and so they've, they've, they've been watching all this kind of stuff. So that, well, I don't know. It, it's going to be the same going forward to some extent as well. I think also if we speak to Marie about having the EU citizens' perspective on it as well. I mean, she does plenty of hillwalking. That's her talking about the difficulties of, of folk who are very uh, in very unsettled situations at the moment. And, and, and just imploring her community to for that support. What about the the local paper? I mean, we I don't read the Alloa Advertiser, but I'm aware it's out there, and I don't think it's got a particularly indie friendly um, perspective. What would be a good way of using that? Because that that the audience there is people that we need to reach. I think during the lockdown, they were obviously um, monitoring, keeping a, a sort of breast of events going on locally for news stories. I don't know if you remember the deer that was um, trapped in the forest near us here. They they instantly spotted that and then made a story out of that for the Allo advertiser. I mean, they've got a, a kind of network of their own of of um, photographers and people who obviously feed them information. So it'd be very interesting to get become part of that network. When I was coaching swimming, we just used to, if we had any competitions, basically what I would do is I would check with the parents, okay, we take a photograph of the kids when we've been at a competition, and I would basically send my photograph in, and I would send my script in, here's what I've written, and basically they didn't even didn't even bother checking it, thank goodness my grammar was okay, you know, because they would just print it almost word for word, they were just desperate to have stuff to put in, it didn't cost them anything. Paper location, I would choose the Alma Tower rather than the Wallace Monument, because the Errol Amar is the, the link between Stirling and Alma, between the towns. Ooh. I think locations are extremely important, yeah. and it might be an idea to make a list of possible PR locations. For example, Wallace Monument, Stirling Castle. Um, Bannockburn House is fascinating. Yeah, Bridge, for example. Mm. When we look at something like uh, YouTube, you see all these vloggers, and they, they have audiences up to a million. So, for example, if you were to establish your own broadcast channel on YouTube with a regular vlogger who had guests on and things like that, you could background the frame with photographs of things like Glenfinnan or Stirling Castle or guys jumping up and down in kilts or something like that. You know, something like that. Something that gets their attention. Having a YouTube channel would be quite an effective media, providing you can make it meaningful, interesting and engaging. I mean, we just, so we've just set one up for Indie Live Radio, which at the moment, it, it's only been on the go for three weeks now. We've got over 100 audios for programs from the radio and some videos but we've got 57 followers have just appeared out of thin air without really doing anything much but what is proving interesting is that little video clips get hundreds of times the views of you can do that on instagram as well because that account is is rising that might be another another way in another thing is is i think that um what we need to do is, within ourselves, establish a media group. And, and really, that means people who prepare to sit down and write a photo script. You know, where it's going to be, who's going to do it, what's the presentation we're going to have? Are, are we going to have some nice old lady, or is it going to be, you know, just a guy with his dog or something like that? So if you can get folks together to do the scripts and work out what you're going to do, then you're halfway there to promoting the message. My only concern is that it's the time scale. It's like the time is now. We're not, we've not got, we've not got yeah. a lot of time in our gift. We need to be getting up. Yeah, this. we just need to because jump in, don't we? Mm. Otherwise, all the stuff that's being churned out, when you look what's happening, when you go to Tesco's now, you try and buy something that hasn't got a massive effing union flag emblazoned on it. Before, like the UHT milk used to have a tiny wee British farmers and it would have the wee truck, the wee, the wee tractor, and there would be a tiny wee union flag on it. Then what happens is the top of the UHT milk has it got a union flag the whole way across the top. Buy salad, prepared salad. I only know this because I pick it up for the only old stuff. I'm not going to Tesco and buy stuff. But now across the, the, the polythene bag or whatever, the cellophane bag that the prepared salad is in, it's a union flag the whole way across the top. It's so 
in your face. That could be our first film, though, couldn't it? Because you can wander around the supermarket shelves with your phone on record. We could record all the products and we could compare Aldi to Lidl to Tesco to Morrison's, and that's your first story. Uh, you copy in front when you keep Scotland the brand for that as well, then that's the highlight that too, they want to share it. And actually, Scotland, the Keep Scotland the Brand has got the sort of facts and figures about, you know, if you if you brand this with a Saltar, you'll get X number more sales than if you brand it with a Union Jack. So there is some, we could join it with them, yeah. Well, in, in which spirit, it might be an idea to actually appoint someone within your group as a public relations liaison person. And the reason I say that is because once we get started, we're going to have a lot of back and forth communications between ourselves and the media. So you're going to have to have somebody who can communicate effectively to counter criticism or to present our point of view. And I, I think that that's going to be quite necessary as this progresses, that if you have someone who's in charge of communications, then you've, you've got the go-to person who's going to be responsible for getting in touch with Tesco. You know, dear Tesco, why do you have so many Union Jacks on your packaging and stuff like that? Someone to to write, a, for example, a news release to the daily papers. You know, something I used to do in, in my previous life was type out news releases, and there is a kind of knack to it. And the secret is simply to double space everything, have a banner headline, and keep it very, very brief. And if you've got someone who's going to do a news release to Tesco and say, Dear Tesco, why are you fronting Union Jacks in Scotland? You may not get the response you want, but you will get a response. Equally, if you're talking to the national newspapers as well, because once this gets off the ground, you're going to get a lot of flack. It's that simple. Well, thank you very much for coming along this morning, Peter. I don't know if, if, if you want to move on to other subjects, I'm, I, I just don't want this whole thing to be dominate the, the morning. Oh, no, this has been really, really interesting. I, just trying to think of practical things within our gift, given that we're clax based and we're a handful of women who've all got other things in our lives, how best we could actually get this moving quickly and effectively. It's There's another media outlet. University campuses can be very useful. What if you have a liaison person for each university campus? There's a good way to get in touch with young people. Well, think about. Colleges as well. Fourth Valley. Colleges as well, mm. yeah. You're going to have to get our own segmentation going as well, where you have somebody who direct communications, somebody involved in organising, somebody involved in filming. It's really a distribution of the talents. Well, we have many talents to distribute. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's uh, very interesting. Yeah, I think it's a good point to address that that's, that's quite a bit for us to go and really properly mull over at the moment. But I, I'm, I'm assuming, Peter, that you're, you're happy for us to kind of have you back for, for further uh, discussions and ideas. Um, sure. I'm happy to be of, of use, you know. Whatever use I can bring to bear, I'm happy to share my modest modicum of wisdom with you. <laughs> what I have had recently is a, a number of trolls, and what people seem to be doing on Facebook just now is they seem to be constructing the, the rudiments of a profile with a few circular photographs, nothing in the about section, and they come on and they harass me. I had a guy yesterday who claimed to be called Emmett Pierce, who he said was from Ireland, a lecturer at Trinity College Dublin. Well, right away when I looked at his profile, when he first spoke to me, I thought, this has got to be a troll, and I was right. What he did was he posted something from a website called um, Scottish Nationalist Destroyers, and it was all about this uh, shifting the border across the sea business. Anyway, the point is that this raises the question of how do we deal with trolls? You've already indicated you wouldn't wish to go into a bit of trolling ourselves, although it happens. It happens. But um, it, it comes across of how do you actually uh, get your message across? Do you, do you go down the negative route and say, Tories corrupt, look what's going on in London, it's all terrible, 
the Lord's getting there three, four hundred pounds a day, etc. Yeah, mm. how does that go down in Ratlock or in some place in Edinburgh? You know, it, it comes back to having a clear concept of what we're trying to say. Does the negative message work? Does the positive message work? In my experience, the positive message always outweighs the negative message. Interesting. People listen to positives rather than negatives. Positive messaging, we could probably very easily do a lot more of that. Do you know who's really good at it? Lorraine will post just a, a, a card with a kind of sentence in it, and that's her post for the day. Yeah, that's great. That's mm. fantastic. You know, the shorter the message, the better. Yeah. Uh, particularly in, in people in the C1, C2 group get totally turned off by big, long spiels. What yeah. they want is something that really just slaps them in the face and say, hey, look at this. Yeah. You know? So that's great. That's fantastic. We could do more of that. I was say, yeah, we can do slapping in the face as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if you think about it, the, neg- the negative side really quickly turns into what about me, doesn't it? And then and then you've lost people because however much you've talked about having a dialogue between two people, that then becomes very quickly a, uh, but what about this, but what about this, but what about that, yeah. and, and people lose interest. I have to say, I think Boris is quite a unifying thing because I've never yet found anybody with anything good to say about him, whatever their political flavour. You never get people defending him on Facebook. Well, that's that's a very interesting point. And uh, I want to kind of run with that, if I may, very, very briefly. When you look at how the, the average Tory voter living in downtown Dorking or Hazelmere or some leafy parts of the English shires, how they got on to Boris Johnson, this love of Boris, he became a kind of iconic figure. I've always wondered, what was that? Was it the fact that he came from this uh, very salubrious, posh background? Was it the hairdo? Was it something in the way he spoke? And that, again, has a takeaway for us, because unless you've got the right person talking, nobody's going to listen. So if we understand the importance of the presenter in the medium, then we begin to understand how people actually deconstruct what you're actually trying to say. So the success of Boris Johnson is very, very instructive for us all. So what that means is, our takeaway is, we need an upfront PR person who looks good, who is probably youthful, who can speak, who's uh, eloquent without sounding pompous, who who, who can also be very, very adaptable. What quality Johnson has is his ability to go into a working-class neighborhood and somehow not alienate people. At least he used to be able to do that. And and there's something in his bumbling manner. Now, I'm going to give you another example of who was like that. Jimmy Savile. Jimmy Savile had this eccentric hairdo, the sort of bumbling talk, you know, how about that then? You know, things like that. He, he could walk into anywhere, and somehow the eccentric image gave him some kind of media credibility. So Johnson is very much in the same mold, and that's something we can take away from and learn from in how we present our message. Uh, and I would challenge the point that you said, Beth, you're about people not liking Boris, I'm just finding, you know, some folks that I maybe went to school with have this loyalty, they have this unwavering, oh. you know, you go by to you show, show them, you tell them. I've not come across that. Going. Interesting. You know, it's, it's not really many, it's not really many, mm. um, but it is I happening. think there are more than you expect, and the trouble is that there's an entire division, Division 77, that people paid all day just to make up profiles and... Uh, all promise, all messaging with Union Jacks and mm. thumbs up all day long. You get all this, you know, and it's I love Boris, and you know, isn't Boris so attractive? And they put up a picture of the entire cabinet and try and turn them into some sort of iconic, beautiful mm. sort of celebrities, you know. So that message is getting pumped out all the time. I think we're in an almost unique situation right now because of the first minister's daily briefings, and you've gone from. When she started off and she was very sort of tentative and here's what I'm trying to do and 
very solemn. And actually, she's built up trust over the last couple of months to the point that the polls are reflecting the people of all party voting trust her. And now that the figures are going the way she wanted, she's being vindicated in what she's done. She's getting very feisty with the papers. And it's almost as if she's kind of had to wait till she can take the country with her. And, you know, we've all watched over the months what these journalists are like and what their questions have been like, what their attitudes are like. And I bet most of us are are cheering when she gives them a little bit of a bite back because it's like she's earned it. And I think we're almost in a unique position with how she is viewed. And I check in on the Guardian live blog daily um, and have done for years. And if you'd looked, if you'd mentioned Nicola Sturgeon even six months ago on that, you'd get a whole load of comments about nippy and crankies and just the nonsense knee jerk. But now you very rarely get a negative comment. Most of them are about, I wish she was RFM. And look what happens when you put grown ups in charge. And there's a politician who answers questions. And that has just been her being in front of the camera every day, doing what she's doing and people seeing it. So I think even amplifying that and sharing links to her broadcast could well be a powerful thing. And it also demonstrates the power of propaganda. Call Mm. it what you will, it's still propaganda. So uh, there's a lot to think about there. What is the possibility of of establishing other groups like this throughout Scotland? Because if we just limit it to, you know, this little group here, is there any way we could actually foster other, you know, social media groups across Scotland who would do the same thing? I mean, there's a whole load of groups that already exist. When you think about the Yes groups and Women for Indie groups, yeah. how active they are just now under yeah. current situations, I'm not sure. But it's certainly something, again, through what I'm trying to do through Indie, indie Live Radio is uh, we've got a newsletter just ready to go out. and there's, They've got a mail mailing list of about 2,000. A lot of the contacts are Yes groups. So if we manage to get that route going then perhaps that's something we could, that's a channel we could use to try and reach people. Well, if you appoint a PR coordinator amongst yourselves or who can, you know, bring things together, because in a sense, you need an enabler right now to bring things together to Mm. make stuff happen. If you don't have that, you can't make it happen. You've got the Yes app as well, which was supposed to be getting, maybe Lorraine's the one to ask about. The India app, yeah. And there's also the Hub, but again, the Hub is talking to us. It's it's not reaching outside our bubble, but if it was to try and get a network going of people doing something similar, the HUD could be useful. What's to think about, folks? The what, I think we've got a lot of ideas jumping in. The how is the next thing. The Penny Stones thing, again, I mean, we're all familiar with the Yes Stones, but that became, it went off on its own little thing to support the NHS. So people are far more familiar now with Penny Stones in the outside supermarkets with the NHS they're familiar with that brand of messaging. So if once we get back into that again, um, we can sort of grab a hold of that and take it forward. Yeah. And I think from the yes point of view, there was a kind of consensus that we weren't going to be putting our stones out it for the duration because they were hard surfaces and the virus could potentially survive on it and it would be used against us if, you know, people went down saying, ah, well, it's these yes stones that spread the virus. So, in a, in a way, it kind of halted our messaging because we were finding, I mean, the group grew from when I joined in 2018, I think it was September 2018, I joined the group. There were a couple of hundred in the group. There's now over 7,000 in the group. It's grown so rapidly. So, the you know, links are being made across the country and the message is, was, was going out further and wider. Mm-hmm. Um, but it almost yeah. all came to a kind of like stop. So interesting, going back to what Peter was talking about, about the backdrop and all the rest of it. If you did a little yes on prompt as part of that, at the same time, you instantly multiply your message to two different groups. You're targeting at any given time and the other group, which is already there, which would all then share that and spread it out. So it's a sort of combination of messaging in effect. Mm. That's the key point because one of the things that, that I've noticed since I, I actually began in media many, many decades ago now is that the, inform, the information highway is constantly changing. And 
when we look at world events between, say, 1989 and now, what we notice is that the information highway has become incredibly important. And that means that the key strategist has to achieve what is called the dominant narrative. Now, that's what the regime in London is trying to do just now. They're trying to achieve a dominant narrative. So what we have to do is use the information highway to create our own dominant narrative in Scotland. It's a brave new world out there. If we can actually figure out how, what drives particular social groups, then we achieve dominant narrative. Mm. And that's what the London regime is trying to do just now. Coming back to this, this point again, you know, the, the background and the presentation is the key to the message. It's not so much the message itself, it, it's what they're looking at, what they're feeling. An information war is not one in facts, it's one in feeling, it's one on emotion. If, if you can trigger someone's emotion in your direction, then everything else you're going to say will get through. If the emotion is not triggered, then you will fail. Cue the cat again. Coming back to the animal thing, one of the yeah. um, most popular um, pages on Facebook is God, I don't know if you follow it from the States. And so it's uh, basically a Democrat sort of based um, Facebook page, and it's very, very fun, and very anti-Trump. And they, what they do is um, they, they analyze stories just like most groups do, but they also, a couple of, like once a week, they'll do a meme day. So everyone fires in thousands and thousands of memes, which are really good. Another day, it's Animal Pictures Day, and that's extremely popular as well. So people share all the pictures with their animals. Um, so, albeit in the background there's the hard messaging going on, there's also little days where there's a lot of humour and... Um, I've got like 600 friends or something on Facebook and I can post something political up and I can guarantee I know who's going to respond to it, who's going to share it or whatever. And uh, and people that are, I think, are they seeing this? Are they just ignoring it? Have they actually turned off notifications from me? <laughs> but then I post something with a picture of the cat, you know, lying on the grass, and you get hundreds of likes on it. And I'm thinking, oh no, they're still there. <laughs> so maybe they're seeing, they're maybe not responding to something political, but they might see it and they might read it and it might make them think a bit more about it. So I still think it's worthwhile. A lot of people don't want to engage because they see it as a threat to their jobs. If yeah. people, you know, read their Facebook posts and what they're sharing and stuff, so they're terrified to, they'll read it, they'll read it and acknowledge it. I've got a friend who virtually never does anything, but he, he reads virtually all my posts every day, but he'll never respond to them in any way. And this is something we could do this afternoon, you know, we could all start posting pictures, fire it through all the different groups that we're on and see which ones get the most response because we've got women for indie page with over a thousand yeah. people on it we've got personal pages with probably a different group of people that's a great idea i love that by the way if you look at uh, particular animal uh, memes on facebook one of the ones that i particularly find fascinating is a meme that's entitled lewis wildlife and this is a cat that lives downtown berlin on a waterway and every day you see him sort of jumping onto a boat and he goes for a, a little run down this waterway. He's got thousands and thousands of followers. So, for example, you could have a video of uh, a particular animal character and into the video you can simply talk about Scotland and what, what the character thinks about Scotland and who he's going to vote for. You can turn it into a kind of uh, anthropomorphic... Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for, anthropomorphic, that's the word. Our challenge for this afternoon, get saltar collars on all our pets and get them on Facebook. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> There's a whole small event in the back. We Jimmy hat, I don't know how her cat would let us put a wee Jimmy hat on it. Yeah. One of the first tasks I think you guys need to think about is, is sort of coordinating yourself into, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a task-led group where you've got people doing different things. So if you get people sort of in the group doing different things, you're, you've, you've already started, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what I can do is I can send you perhaps uh, theme scenarios, things you might want to think about. Um, 
interview at the station, people getting off a train. And what you do is you don't just interview anybody. You, you get somebody who is pre-programmed, just like the Tory party does, get them walking off the train and you say, hi, how are you today? And you've got an instant propaganda commercial. Stations are great places because it, it adds a little, you know, soup song of truth to what you're saying. And that's the key for any broadcast you do. It's got to look truthful. Talking yesterday, Tulare said, any chance you could do face masks to put on the statues outside the train station? Go and have a look and see what size they are, because then if you start doing, like, the face masks on the statues, it kind of makes that kind of like, oh, here we are, we should all be wearing our face masks. That would be a brilliant Aloha advertiser story because there's pictures, it's visual, it's local, and it's topical. But, uh, you know, you guys can go off and discuss, you know, who does what and stuff like that. And uh, I'm quite happy to sit back and push the ideas your way. The key thing is location, presentation, and who's actually doing it. Yeah. And keeping in mind what you're trying to say, who you're talking to. Yeah. It's the kind of thing that I think would be useful because, I, as I said, I said before, it's the kind of like we're, we're in, we're in it now. We're at the, we're at the kind of we're right, reaching tipping point. We need to make sure we tip it in our direction, and we can't hang back, and we can't. Yeah, we want things to look slick, but, but how slick do we want them to look? Because then it looks professional and paid for and everything. And no, we want it to look real. We want it to appeal to people, ordinary people like us but we need to make sure we're getting enough ordinary people like us getting the message time is of the essence but maybe from what you've recorded today Fiona we can gather enough we can say look here's a whole list of ideas we've had a wee bit of the background behind it and pass it on to other groups that can maybe do similar in their own locality who doesn't want to make a video with her bed for quite a What you do is you, you take a picture of your cat when it's looking particularly pissed off and you have your own Scots version of Grumpy Cat and then you yeah. it. But I mean, you know, Boris is coming to Scotland, Grumpy Cat moves. We have a pissed so off cat with a jobby on a stick. With a jobby. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people who don't realise, even within the, the wider independence community, the need for speed. Yeah. Because Westminster are using the pandemic and Brexit to revolutionise the devolution mm. settlement. So we don't have the time in our backgrounds and then on. Tw- yeah. 12 minute blethers. 12 minute blethers, I like that. <laughs> as Peter says, it lends itself to more of a nationwide thing. It doesn't become just the here then. In 2014, one of the most uh, effective things that Wifey across Scotland did was uh, having a couple of videos. Lots of people, if you remember, there was the uh, Better Together campaigns, patronising BT late. Yeah, I don't know, I really don't know. That's the one. And there was thousands of responses from Wifey members right across Scotland put out to that, and it was absolutely one of them. The most effective things that we did and that was just everybody Ooh. doing a wee piece to the camera phone and then loading that up uh, i think it was hashtag having a cuppa and the other thing the other people who was were excellent we showcased them in one of our podcasts was the university of dublin when they were having their referendum on the equal marriage thing and the abortion debate and students from, I think it was Trinity College Dublin, had filmed themselves phoning their grannies and asking how they were thinking of voting. And that was really powerful stuff. Fizzing! <laughs> <laughs> well, to think about what you're doing. So that was about the point when everybody ran away to run their heads under a cold tap and let our brains cool down. But very interesting to see how this develops and we'll keep you up to date with uh, progress so that's it for this week been a bit of an extended edition but i hope you've enjoyed it and thank you for listening and we'll catch you all later bye now Yeah.